My name is Ashila Jamdwati. I am an Ashaz woman of Aizol, and I welcome you all to an evening of literature as we gear up to celebrate the second edition of the Right Circle in Aizol. A few months back, Prabhakaitan Foundation forayed into Aizol to initiate its literary journey under the vertical of the Right Circle and widening the spectrum of promoting English literature in the northeastern part of India. We are glad to continue this journey and organize yet another chapter of the Right Circle with eminent personality, Mrs. Lakshmi Mudeshwar Puri, who we have here with us today. We are glad to continue this journey and my fellow Ashas woman from Aizol and my older sister, Emilia Silo, will be our conversationalist for the day. Uh, today's session is in association with Falkland Park and Ashas Women of Aizol and also enjoys the support of eminent patron Sri Simen Limited. So before we move forward with the program, allow me to say a few words about the Prabhakaitan Foundation. It is a Kolkata-based non-profit trust which was established in the 1980s by the late Dr. Prabhakaitan, an eminent literature enthusiast, cultural activist and staunch feminist. The foundation dedicatedly works to connect readers to the literary creations of authors and poets, showcases talented musicians, dancers, performing artists through literary and cultural initiatives. Each initiative of the foundation enjoys a global identity and a niche audience, creating the finest experiences and cultural landmarks on the global map. India is a land of multiple assets, be it literary jewels, art and cultural treasures, ethnic handloom, crafts, or delightful local cuisine. It is this rich heritage that Prabhakaitan Foundation has always aimed to protect from day one until now. The foundation has an active presence in more than 50 cities in India and overseas. It enjoys the patronage of Sri Cement Limited and is ably assisted by distinguished associates, partners and Ashas Women of India in its effort to create cultural capital. So I would also like to formally introduce today's esteemed guest author. Uh, Mrs. Lakshmi Puri has been an Indian Foreign Service diplomat for 28 years. She served in leadership positions at the United Nations for 15 years and most recently as its Assistant Secretary General. She was a leader in the first global organization to promote gender equality, UN Women, for seven foundational years. Among other accolades, she is also the recipient of the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights. Throughout her illustrious career, Lakshmiji has championed the cause of gender equality and women's empowerment as central tenets of sustainable development. So, conversationalist Amelia, apart from being an Eshaz woman, is also a successful professional in her domain of business and a literature lover as well. I will not take up any more of your time. I request you all to keep your phones on silent mode and I will turn over the program to Amelia. Thank you. First of all, I want to welcome Lakshmiji to Mizoram. Is this your first time here? Yes. Um, okay. How was the journey from the airport to the hotel? Oh, far. <laughs> Very far. <laughs> I, th I, I was told that she thought it was 15 minutes, but it was rather 50 minutes, so that's a huge <laughs> difference in time. Well, actually, I was a little nervous about today's session as I felt like I would not do a good enough job in interviewing someone who is so accomplished and wears so many hats. But I was scared that I would not get my point across. I was very, very nervous. I think my husband can <laughs> vouch for me. But I read her book the past week, Swallowing the Sun, her first novel. But that also is such a good one. Um, but when I read her novel, something changed. It's the story of uh, two young girls um, empowered by education, who, are, who became strong and empowered and paved their own way in the end. So that story inspired me and I was not very scared anymore when I finished the book. So the story of your characters inspired me to sit down here and have this conversation with you today. And through this book, you have empowered me to believe in myself and the power within me. I firstly wanted to thank you for that. 
Now, Swallowing the Sun is a novel which has many elements and it deserves multiple reads. The element of friendship and family, the element of love between lovers, the element of woman empowerment, which is personally my favorite one, and the backdrop of Indian society during the fight for Indian independence all makes up for a fantastic novel. The novel inspires and informs all at once. So, my first question would be, the Apam of Muktabai is the epigraph for the novel and the title of your book is derived from it. You have written that it has possessed you forever. Why is this verse so special and ultimately chosen as the title of the book? So first of all, um, I should say Chibai <laughs> and uh, good evening to everyone and uh, thank you to the Prabha Khaitan Foundation and the SAS women of uh, uh, this beautiful uh, state and uh, uh, also of particularly of uh, uh, ISOL. Uh, I'm really um, so impressed by you have absolutely no need <laughs> to uh, fear this conversation with us because I have been totally impressed how you have uh, imbibed the essence of it but also in so many ways reinterpreted and reinvented it. In, in, because we have had this conversation about the book before um, on the phone because this has been such a quick on the go kind of trip for me, the, you know, I'm, I'm going to four different uh, places in the Northeast. So it's really a great pleasure to be in conversation with someone like you. I know that you are yourself a book lover. I'm told that you are, you have launched a veritable campaign to get children to read, uh, ignite their interest in reading. And uh, also, I think uh, SRS and the PK Foundation's mission is also that. So thank you for being the flag bearer of that here uh, in Aizon. Let me um, answer your question and thank you for very comprehensively describing what the book is about. Uh, the title, Swallowing the Sun, is taken from a 13th century saint, a teenage woman saint, Muktabai, who is now worshipped as Adi Shakti. There are some temples in her name. Uh, but she, in her 18 short years, became a mystic saint in her own right, which was rare. Uh, her brother, Sant Nyaneshwar, is well known and everybody even today knows about it. So I came across this uh, one of the 41 verses or abhangas she wrote, she wrote, came across this very early on and as you said it possessed me for many years because it's such an inspiring surreal, if surreal poem about attaining the unattainable and that anyone who has faith, who dares, who perseveres, can fly like the little ant, fly into the sky and swallow the sun. So let me recite to you the original Marathi poem and then uh, to give the English version. Mungi Uragi Akashi Tine gille suryash, thor navla vazhala, paans putra prasabla, vinchu patara si zai, shesh matha bandhi bai, maashi vyali khar zhali, dekho ne muktai hasi. The ant flies into the sky, she swallows the sun, another miracle. A barren woman gives birth to a son. The scorpion burrows down to the nether realms 
the snake king Shesha bows his head at its feet. The house fly begets a hawk. Muktabai sees all, Muktabai laughs. So this, as I said, surreal though it may seem, is about daring to make miracles. And whether and and all my most of my work, I won't say all because many are very much high bound and bound down by the shackles of their circumstances or or uh, their uh, you know, a role play and how they see themselves in the, in, in the world. But also, but most of the women characters in my um, novel and some men characters also uh, are like Mukta Bhai's ants, trying to achieve the unattainable. What seems at that time, and I want to make that qualification. You know, what is impossible is in your mind half the time, at least. And if you overcome that, uh, then uh, you can do anything. So this, you can be anything, you can do anything, provided you have faith and daring, and you make that effort. I think that is something that comes through. And it is also, uh, and perhaps we'll come to that when we talk about the historical, the freedom struggle part, because it also applies to the freedom struggle. So that is that is as far as the title and and the epigraph that I have used of Mukta Bai as a link motive of this book. Thank you. So uh, when Nam talks about miracles and dreaming beyond what is ordinary and what we can imagine, like the characters in the book, they dreamt beyond so that us today could do what is ordinary. Like they paved their way for their education and they fought their way for education. So girls like us today, education is a right. Right? So, although it's fiction, it's very true to its time, so that's what I wanted to talk about and how the repercussions have um, had such positive effects on our generation also. So, on the first page, coming to my next question, on the first page of your book you've written, To my mother, Malati Desai, and father, B.G. Murdeshwar, who inspired me to believe that only if you dare can miracles happen. How have their parenting and your upbringing influenced you to dream beyond the ordinary and achieve all that you have achieved? Well, um, well, you know, uh, I don't think that my achievement is in discussion today. I would rather <laughs> like to focus on uh, the book and my parents what they were. And you rightly said, and I want to talk about who are heroes and sheroes. And this book is very much inspired by the fact that in my mind, they were ordinary people who dared to become extraordinary. And that is the definition of a hero. And in whatever circumstance. So, uh, whether you look, like, look at Malti in this book, and it's very much modeled on um, my mother. She comes from Ratnagiri, a small village in Maharashtra. Daughter of a farmer, Anna Vaidya. And he, in turn, is looking outside his narrow patriarchal world that he has grown up in. And he is inspired by the social reformers of that time, Maharshi Karve and uh, Mahatma Phule and all these people. They were all from Ratnagiri, by the way. So it was also one of the, uh, you know, fertile grounds for social reform, reformers to emerge. So he was very influenced by that. So you do need, 
advocacy and movement building and people, you know, ordinary people then become heroes based on that and take up that cause. So he took up that cause, start, and then you, when you do that, you start with your home. How, and your family. The reform outside comes from our home, you know, Char like charity is. It begins at home. So it, he, therefore, he sent his two daughters to a school which was only for boys. And he got special permission. And then later he wanted other girls also to go. So this is that spirit. The men also being heroes to support, uh, uh, you know, the empowerment of girls. So then the girls are given that opportunity and then they take it up. So Malti then, you know, seizes her destiny in her own hand at every stage. But she's enabled as much. She's not stopped by her father, which was very much the case because you are in, in those days, perhaps less so now, but certainly those days, you know, your destiny was very much decided by what your parents wanted you to do or didn't want. And what is important is the mother also was supportive, although always outraged by her husband's, you know, outlandish ideas and his wanting to treat them as, you know, uh, uh, boys, like boys, you know. He, she would always say, how can you do this? But he said, no, I will. So, Malti's journey is very much that of, and from there, her being able to have, first of all, first being sent, uh, cast away, as she felt, into uh, ashram school, uh, uh, orphanage school, and then from there, but she finishes there with great distinction, then she goes on as a pioneering woman graduate of Elphinstone College in Mumbai lives alone with her sister in PG accommodation. Can you believe that? 1920s. And then from there, where she meets Guru, the love interest in this. But also, uh, Guru himself is very much, again, modeled on my father, but a very enlightened man, women respecting and very supportive. So, first they begin as friends and then and then after that, Malti and he, of course, they make uh, sacrifices for each other and all of that happens. But what I'm trying to say is that each one of them, and then later Malti uh, in, in real life uh, fails to swallow the sun. She gives up her legal uh, career. And she always regretted that. And she always told me, never give up your career. You must always be someone in your own right. So this is what I would say to all the young ladies who are here. And, and the men. Because today it's, uh, you know, sometimes there is an issue of two career balancing, um, being in the same place or not. And um, I'm um, uh, very privileged to have uh, Secretary uh, uh, Renu Sharmaji here and she is very familiar with those kind of <laughs> accommodations we have to make as tandem couples or otherwise. So um, she, but my father of course went on to uh, become someone who was able to make really a very substantive and I would say heroic contribution at the time of partition when he uh, was able to, uh, he came up with a very innovative scheme for um, refugee rehabilitation and resettlement, and which really was a, a breakthrough idea because it enabled millions of refugees to be accommodated in evacuee property. So that was one. And then the second one, and, and there is a testimonial from the then Chief Minister about his contribution. And then the second one was his participation in the constitution making uh, with uh, Dr. Ambedkar. So all of those, that whole, their 
role and, and in different ways they participated in the Satyagraha and all that. So all of that inculcated in me uh, a strong sense of nationalism, of also, you know, at that time there is a very important, um, that generation was very much influenced by the, cult, the civilizational reawakening that was happening. Uh, the sense of being Indian was suddenly being ignited in different parts of India and this is this captures the Maharashtra uh, part and that's how in the novel I track their uh, participation first as theatre, theatre as resistance. There is a play they stage, uh, it's a revolutionary play but they, for the first time in Elephant Street College to get these western educated boys, mostly boys, there were only six girls at that time, to join the Satyagraha movement. And uh, of course they have to do it in a very careful way so that the authorities don't stop the play being enacted and all of that. Then I also track, going further, I also track how they participated in the Simon Commission protests uh, uh, by Yusuf Merrily and then they are lati charged. Later she fights a trial, a major trial, political trial, um, and wins. Uh, so there are these many, and then later in Banaras, there are six chapters in Banaras where she has to deal with her own definition of patriotism. Can she support revolutionaries? Can she support armed resistance vis-a-vis you know, peaceful resistance. So she's very conflicted and how that conflict, and that was part of a larger conflict young people felt at that time. So, you know, this is the, so, you know, to me, again, this is something that a daughter will always lionize her parents, but in that measure that I have mentioned, uh, I therefore felt that they were uh, worthy of being celebrated in a novel like this. I didn't want it to be a biography. I wanted it to be fiction because in many ways fiction brings out the truth more than uh, a dull, somber or sober <laughs> biography will bring up. So that, that is the, the connection that I wanted to make. And uh, yes, uh, you know, they were not perfect. Uh, nobody would say that I, either as parents or as people, but uh, they tried, you know, and this perfectibility, what they taught us, uh, you know, you were asking how, how did they, learn. what they taught us was that one must always try. And I think our Indian civilizational value is about the perfectibility of humanity and also the irrepressible human spirit always, uh, you know, prevailing. So that is something that uh, one would, uh, one, one imbibed from them. And uh, this is what we also, I also try to convey in this novel and for, for others to also be inspired by that. I think, thank you. I think anyone who reads the novel can see the influence of her parents through the characters. Uh, Malati, the, the protagonist, I think is named after your mother. And I think you write her with such familiarity that I'm sure she's <laughs> modeled so much after her. Yeah. So, um, the next, uh, my next um, question is, how was the journey of this novel being published? I know that you've had this, I read somewhere that you've had this idea for more than 20 years when you were still in the service, but you never got around to working on it and writing it. And you started working on it during COVID, right? When the rest of the world was baking banana bread, she was she started on she started on her novel. Me included. Uh, she started on her novel, and I think I read. I also read that you all wrote this on an iPhone. Is that correct? Correct. <laughs> you answered the question. <laughs> so, uh, in 
Uh, can you share the uh, journey of the novel from its ideation to finally finishing it? And I also read that your husband has been a huge encourager uh, and promoter of your book, and he has encouraged <laughs> you to finish the book and get started. So you have answered all the questions, but I can just say that, uh, as I mentioned, I was always inspired by my parents' generation. You know, I was born when they were 45. So, um, you can imagine, we are, you know, two generations apart. So, I was fascinated by the world that they represented. Secondly, they were great, as I've said in the uh, author's note, they were great storytellers. And each had a different style of telling those stories. So, I did want to tell their story, a story which I felt had never been told before and which perhaps uh, was waiting to be told. You know, so that was always there in my mind. But you know, one is, uh, um, I was busy for many decades, so to say, with my career, my marriage, my children, all of that preoccupied and somehow never got down to it. They passed away in the 80s. No, my father was 84 and then my mother passed away in 2000 actually when I was in Budapest. So that was a kind of watershed and I said I have to now get down to do something about this. Plus I discovered these 148 letters, love letters of my father in a tin trunk and as I was leaving for Budapest, and I said, oh my God, I have to do something, uh, you know, draw upon this rich treasure trove of um, the sentiments and, and so much of, you know, the reflection of what it was like. Uh, it made me feel as if I was inhabiting that, that era. So I said, I have to use this. And so I took all of that along, I made it into you know, some kind of a, those days, some photocopies and all of that. Um, 1929 to 1932, those letters were from. So, um, anyway, so all of that. Then I started in Budapest, Ambassador Latte <laughs> knows some of our postings are, are very, um, uh, uh, you know, give you a lot of creative space. <laughs> and it was one of those postings where we were also separately posted. My husband was in London, I was with my younger daughter. So I started, I wrote 100 pages and after that I had a mental block because I felt maybe I have, you know, I wanted to do a three generation thing. My generation, my elder daughter's generation would have gone to the US at six, age 16 and had started working there. So, you know, that is how this sat for, for uh, 20 years without being tended. And then also I got busy. I had an excuse that I'm very busy with my career. And I regret that, I must confess. I'd rather have had this novel come out 20 years ago. But it's all right. I'll never better there I do this time. <laughs> and uh, yes. So I wrote it during COVID time, urged by my sister, who has been my, you know, sister in, uh, sister in this labor of love, in more ways than just uh, by blood. And uh, so we complete. I, I completed this 270,000 word first draft in one year working day and night, well day and night meaning about 10 hours a day, sometimes of course at night you get these epiphanies and you get up and say you want to, you know, like my brother-in-law used to say, so are you going to kill her or are you going to let her live? You know, it's such an exciting thing to be, uh, to play God or goddess in this case, uh, create characters, you know, tell, make them go through certain corridors of experience, take them to different destinations. It's it's a wonderful uh, journey. 
Thank you. Sorry for coughing. I've, I've been suffering from a cold for the past three weeks. <laughs> I'm joining. Yeah, <laughs> she's joining the club also. I've been fighting off an allergic cold or something. Yes. Okay, so on to the next question. So I'll just read some, um, some paragraphs from the book which yes. I love. And they loved and admired Baba for daring to set them free, and Ayi for not stopping him, even though like the ladies in the village assembly, it went against all she knew as Sri Dharma. Other 11, 12-year-old girls in the neighborhood were already getting married. Malati and Kamala were scared of marriage, having seen how men ill-treated their wives. And also there's another paragraph from a different chapter. He explained how he had tried to lift down the ignominy he had suffered when he took up the cause of girls going to school in Ratnagari. Malati and Kamala, at his, as his intermediate past daughters who would soon be going to Elphinstone College as pioneers, were his revenge on the small minds of the Ratnagari Panchayat and those ignorant men and women who failed to see the light. So from these chapters, I would like to form this question. This book, although branded as a coming-of-age story, is more about the story of two young girls as they break barriers which have never been broken by women before. Their father, my personal favorite character from the book, is the silent hero who made it all possible. His unwavering support for his daughters to dream beyond the ordinary and his willingness to take whatever blame he may get from society in my opinion, makes him the greatest champion of women empowerment. What is the role of fathers and the men in our lives in improving the quality of the females around them? Uh, well, uh, you know, I've covered this Baba's role before and you, you expressed it so beautifully. Uh, what I can say is, when I was with UN Women, uh, you know, we were doing um, advocacy and we were also running campaigns and one of the campaigns we ran was with fathers of girls because they are the prime movers of change and uh, to bring about change particularly in societies where like in India where you still have this perversity of boy preference and girl aversion. And I'm told in the northeastern states, this is not the case. And I think you hold up uh, a great example, positive example of that. Uh, but in many of our states, and that's why we had a sex ratio issue, right? A skewed sex ratio, but thanks to the campaign of Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao. Actually, this is what Baba did. Because what he did was that he said he was determined that his daughters would not like his own wife who died very early. Uh, repeated childbirths, early marriage, child motherhood, child marriage. He didn't want them to go through that. He said, no, they have equal right like the boys to be celibate scholars and to have careers you know, go to higher education, have careers. So that kind of, uh, you know, a very progressive thinking is, is what is uh, shown here. So this is one. The other is women's role is this and women's place is in the home and women has to marry and bear children. You know, one Shabriddhi, as the old woman in the village says, huh? And he's, she says very mockingly to Baba that if you want to, uh, you know, our, our place is in the home, we are very comfortable. Who are you? Are you Sri Krishna to tell us that uh, we should uh, change that? Um, if you want your, uh, if you want that your children should do uh, Purshat outside the house, then bear some sons, you know. So she taunts him. So there is that role play, which again in the novel I try to um, demolish. Uh, that woman's place is every place she can be and do anything. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. She has empowered her character so much. She's empowered them, given them so much power through the freedom of education that I think in the end the most um, inspiring part was that they were able to make their own decisions in their life instead of depending on someone else. And that the men around her, the men around them, whether it was their father, whether it was their brother-in-law, yes. or whether it was their uh, husbands, their boyfriends, their friends, so, empowered them to a point where they never gave up. Even when they, they gave up on themselves, the men in their lives have always encourage them. So yes. I think that's how it was so important yes. for the role of men in our lives, for us to be empowered. It's not that we cannot be empowered alone, it's just that we need their support also to, yes. in, to rise up in society. So, and another enticing element uh, in the book is the love stories between the various characters. Um, I think Guru, Malati's love interest is based on your loosely on your father, he yes. is a champion for women's rights and yes. has supported Malati in all of her career decisions and life decisions. And there's also different kinds of love that she has portrayed in the book. For example, the love between the protagonist Malati and Guruji is a ferocious kind of love where they can see nothing else but themselves, where they proclaim their unending love for each other. Uh, to each other every day. And there's also love that, um, another kind of love, uh, like the love between Ali and Baba, that was more quiet, but it's present mm. daily mm. and can be seen wow. daily in their lives. Mm -hmm. Or the mutual, the love and mutual respect born out of circumstances and the arranged marriages that we can see in the yeah. case of their brother-in-law and their wife. So, would you like to explore on these various relationships? Well, you have already done it so beautifully <laughs> and so insightfully because, you know, these things don't reveal themselves always in the way you have done to even the writer, but you have explained it so well. Thank you. No, um, I think this is an epic love story. Uh, someone called it love in the time of the freedom struggle, <laughs> like love in the time of cholera. <laughs> so um, this is, um, you know, the Guru Mahathir love story is also about an exploration of the Ardha Narishwar principle and the man-woman relationship as women started coming into public life into the public domain, whether it is in schools or colleges or in careers. And so how did men adapt to that? So I was always very curious and they used to tell me their stories. And of course, much of it is also imagined uh, and reconstructed from memory and stories and how memory interprets that my memory, but also much of it is imagined. Um, but it is also about how the novelty of uh, that situation, when women and men met in those surroundings. So, and that love was flourished in, you know, the literary context. They shared literary, love of literature, poetry, theater, music, uh, so there was, and the aesthetic, you know, the aesthetic bond. So there are many bonds that I have tried to explore in exploring this mystique core of love. And then there is this, uh, that it is also fired by their common uh, love for India and the idea of India. You know, so, and then they are also, you know, when they face adversity, how they do it together, how they have to sacrifice, and how you are tested in, in your result. So all of that. But most importantly, I think here I want to quote uh, a poem which I have written uh, in order to illustrate this, the nature of Guru and Malti's love. And it goes through its ups and downs. It's not an ideal relationship and I don't think any of us believes that everything can be perfect all the time. 
even in the best of uh, love uh, relationships. So there is this poem of mine which is my original poem. There are others which are translations. So uh, where he defies, you know, he uh, proposes, propose, I mean, not proposes, but uh, this is after he has declared his love. But at a certain point when they are facing some challenges, he calls her a goddess installed in my temple sanctum sanctorum to the exhilarating heartbeats of celestial drums, my fevered chanting and joyous limpid songs. You accept me as my devote, as your devotee and I pledge my whole life to you. And then he goes on to say that uh, I will in turn shield you from non-believers in your divinity. And then he ends by saying, My Panchaprana, the five vital life forces drawn from cosmic springs, I consecrate to you, my Devi. Let the Spirit Divine merge my soul with yours and our bodies entwine. O Madhumalti, let the beguiling veil of Maya once and for all be pierced and fall between the manifest and the truth, between the striving and the attainment, between the worshipper and the worshipped, between me and you. And then what happens? Down the line, if you remember, in uh, when they go to Simla and she has given up her job to be there with him, she somehow feels diminished, she feels ignored, she feels that he's no longer, uh, you know, the worshipper and she's no longer installed, that he himself perhaps has uh, been installed, uh, self-installed as uh, a god. So then she confronts him later with this and says, this was your pledge, a ring of recognition from the Shakuntalam uh, trope. So, uh, and then, so she turns and, and says, no, no, but uh, he protests and he says, no, no, I still believe you are a goddess. So she said, don't have any illusions because I am a goddess, not because you made me so. I am a goddess because of who I am and what I have done for you. So this, this play of of the, the part of the love story is also, you know, in Indian society we tend to deify on one side and then demean on the other side. So what we need to continue to do is to be true to that deification <laughs> and, and uh, the sense of equality uh, that we must uh, continue to nurture. So, Certainly that's part and the give and take, you know, there is so much that both sides must, uh, you know, give and take in, in any love, any friendship, any love uh, relationship. I then and now. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. In any relationship, like when uh, Malati and Kamala agree readily to take on Veena as their kid and to yes. look after her when their sister asked them to, yes. I think that's the kind yes. of love that yes. you are talking about. Yes. And Absolutely. just unconditional love that yes. doesn't question the request yes. of the other person. Yes. So, it, and, and gratitude. I think and there gratitude, is, yes. you know, there is, uh, we have in our times, I often reflect in my uh, senior years now, I reflect on the ingratitude factor <laughs> in life. How much that takes away from human relationships. You know, how, how gratitude adds a value to your, uh, and, and happiness, yes, of course. Yes. And gratitude, not just gratitude in your mind, but gratitude that is expressed. Because yes. that yes. was, I think, one of the problems when we were in Shimla, that yes. they had marital problems, yes. a little rough patch, yes. when Malati felt like she was not, um, 
honored because yeah. of her sacrifices. But I think Guru was not just expressing his gratitude enough at that time. Yes. Yeah. And then, and and you see, there I don't know whether readers feel it yeah. so, but uh, I also felt as I was writing about this that she was also imagining it because she was in a weak position. Mm, yes. She had herself left her career. Yes. And she was feeling vulnerable. She was feeling small. You know. Yes. She didn't have that purpose. Yeah. She's so always had purpose. Uh, yes. yes. So that imagine you then imagine slides. You imagine that you know you're not being valued. Of course. So that's why you should not give up your career <laughs> again. <laughs> So, now I'll read some more paragraphs from the book, just to get to my next question. Malati, what is happiness? Is happiness a placid sense of stability and contentment, devoid of thrill or fear? Or is it about alternating between the depths of anguish and the peaks of elation? Do we get most pleasure in realizing our own aspirations or living up to someone else's? Is your disappointment at your being denied your cherished dreams greater than the thrill of receiving other unexpected boons delivered to your doorstep, Kamala asked. I think happiness is all of this and more. I know you say that anyone can buy my happiness for a paisa. So low is my threshold. But I do need Mahi's injunction to have the unhappy ambition of doing something way beyond my capacity or circumstance, like Muktabais and Scorpion, Housefly and Barren Woman, who have the audacity, audacity to, make, to try to make miracles, whether I succeed or not, Malati replied. So the book touched on many philosophical questions and topics through its clever and ingenious way of hiding it in the conversation between the characters. I myself stopped while reading the book many times to ponder of the, over the messages like these. I have noticed that all your characters' real happiness stems from intangible things like love from family, and their partners, support from their friends, and doing good deed for others, and being a good instrument to society. Is this your outlook on life and can you elaborate further on that, please? Thank you. No, I think I cannot elaborate further because you have done it so beautifully. No, absolutely. That is so true. And yes, uh, you know, philosophy was one of the... I never studied philosophy, but... Um, and here I want to come back to my parents because they were real with ones. Not only were they uh, well versed in three languages, Sanskrit, Marathi and English and Latin because they had to study law. Uh, uh, at that time Latin was very much part of legal studies. And, uh, but they were also, uh, you know, very polyvalent in terms of philosophy, political science, um, uh, then uh, the classics, uh, you know. So that, the philosophy part about what is my purpose in life, who am I, uh, who are others to me, what is this world to me and what I can do in this world. I think this is a question that has, uh, you know, always agitated uh, me personally, but also, you know, they were always reposing those questions and encouraging us to do that. And that's being part of, you know, being a complete person, a complete human being. Yeah, absolutely, you, you've captured it very well. Thank, Thank you. So this is uh, oh, a little in line with the thing that she was saying about women in their careers. So this is another passage from the book. Concentrate on your mission, on your mission of studies, girls. The freedom struggle will go on for decades. The mighty British are not going to give us freedom so easily or so quickly, so you can always contribute after your education is complete. Let the men make the sacrifice. They have enjoyed the privilege of education for long. <laughs> and there's another passage here uh, that says, Know that it will be a long time before you come close to being regarded equal to men, but show them that you are truly their shakti and power. That is for your own good that you should stand up and stand up tall. The ashram inspired by the great Maharani Ahil Yabai is meant to instill in you the confidence that you can navigate the world on your own now. Be self-reliant. So I wish you all the very best. Go 
Outside these gates, only our prayers are with you. Go and spread your enlightenment to other girls. So, so from here, I would like to form this question of, you have been a champion for women's rights and women empowerment in every field that you have dabbled in. The book is a testament to what women can do if they are given the freedom to dream and granted equal opportunities as men. Can you share your insights, thoughts and beliefs on the female importance of female education and empowering women for a developed country? And also another question alongside that is the more quiet women characters of the books like their mother, i.e. Their, sis their sister Sureka, make many sacrifices in their lives without complaining, accepting their fate as women who serves men and lives to mother children. Their lives also enabled Malati and Kamala to pursue their dreams of breaking boundaries for women. Do you think these kind of women need to coexist for one to strive further? Or can we all move forward together? What is needed for equal empowerment without one having to sacrifice the other? So I think the first question we covered very much in, in the earlier part. So I will, uh, you know, and you have also read passages which conveys that sentiment about women's empowerment. And But I will read to you, there is a time when Malti has to, is told that she has to leave Banaras Hindu University because she has wittingly or unwittingly uh, been involved with the revolutionaries. And it was the policy, official policy, that they don't support armed resistance uh, So uh, as, as faculty. So when she's leaving, she's very despondent. Then there is this, and her students really see her as a shiro, you know. And uh, so they have a little dinner for her. And at that dinner, this Marathi girl gets up and recites a poem, which I think, uh, you know, uh, really conveys the idea that you have uh, sought. And it is called, um, it's a poem by N.B. Tilak. And it is... Bola have te malaka yutyace, Pure zana to me tsamase, Bada. Jauntily holding an elephant calf in one hand, in the other, with a mewling lion cub, I stand, the majestic tiger, half dead with fear, from his cave cautiously does peer, and so on. And then says, I am truly realized and self-aware, recognizing myself, my name I proudly bear. So this is an anthem for empowered women, but also men, and for all Indians at that time, who, was try who were trying to find themselves. So I am truly self-realized and self-aware, of a mirror I have no need, or a path free of stone and weed. Am I not complete and auspicious? Because at that time, they used to even say, Kulachini, you know, that women are not auspicious. Even during certain times of the month, for example. So, you know, am I not complete and auspicious of God's creatures felicitous? I have no more regard for your opinion. I well know my own strength and dominion. So this is the essence of it. Now on the other question of uh, the other women, yes, it takes all kinds to make the world. And not every woman is able to rise above her circumstance. But they complement and they support. And both these women, Ai and Sudeka's example you have given, they support uh, the, the liberation of the others. So my question is, so my question is, do you think that women like these, like who support and take a uh, seat back so, at, for, so that other women could flourish and take flight, do you think that they still need to exist in today's world or we can all grow together or do you think that we still lack the opportunity to do that as all of us rising together? I think all of us rising together. Um, it is true that 
these these uh, Sulekha and I, uh, you know, were supported. Yes. But even if they had been empowered, yes. it would be a force multiplier. <laughs> they don't have to be held back so that others can rise. I think everybody has to go together. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we're coming towards the end of the session. So, I would, so can you receive like um yeah. So I, the book is can you receive like um yeah. So I, the book is has a lot of poetry and it's a, it is a treasure for poetry lovers and I would like to recite more of her poetry from her book before our session ends. So there is uh, as you said quite a lot of poetry Kalidasa's Maid Dood, uh, Kalidasa's uh, Abhigyan Shakuntalam I've translated from some verses from there. Uh, it's used for both evocative purposes, uh, but also a narrative purpose often. Uh, and then uh, I have used a lot of Marathi poetry. Marathi Natya Sangeet, uh, it's sprinkled with that uh, because I show, um, you know, Bal Gandharva, the great Bal Gandharva, the singer, uh, also as one of the characters in the book. So let me uh, recite uh, two or three of, you know, this, is, this was my father's uh, book of poetry that he hand wrote. And there is one which has been shown on the first page when, when you get the book. This is uh, his handwritten. And this was uh, for Lakshmi. Electrostatic 1983 of manuscript of 1926. So this was, you know, uh, so this is uh, called Prem Lake by the great poet, Marathi poet, Pal Kavi. And this guru uh, writes on the sand. They are sitting together on the beach. This is the first time he declares his love for her. So far it has been uh, a friendship, uh, love was growing but undeclared. So the first time he declares and he then uh, uses this poem in order to make that declaration. And he used to sing each of these poems out in a different tune. And, uh, and that has remained with me over the years. So I would like to do that now. Medhan che kari burja patra dharuni Astan chali pratyahi Swargi che navale khakum kumarase Ti sandhya devi lihi Ratri shant gabhir ambu nidhi cha Anil prushtavari Lajja lekhali vikampit kare Teetar ka sundari Sare te magalekh tuchha gamati Chitta chiya lochani Tiza akshaya lekh Eka chubha Mi magna para Yani So the English translation is Holding the birch bark of clouds in our hand The glorious sunset as a perennial witness grand her pen dipped in the red sack of my love infinite, the evening goddess writes a new missive exquisite. With enchanting shyness her cheeks suffused, my beloved rests her lotus head on my chest bemused. She creates our love episodes mystique in the poetic language of our breaths unique. All those are the lyrical outpourings magnificent in my heart's eye seems so trivial and insignificant, for I am the soul wrapped and discerning reader, Vernal, in the universe of this, my beloved's love letter 
eternal. Then there is another poem which he recites on the day of their on their nuptial night, and it is a, it is a day they have waited for eight years, uh, and it's a consummation of love uh, that has been you know uh, there for eight years. But so when he recites, wants to recite that, she says, Malti says, but why are you reciting this poem, which is a pond eager to meet the ocean, but it is about love unfulfilled. And he turns and he turns around and said, says that, but this is why I want you to remember how far we have come and we may just not have made it. So let's cherish this and that's why I want to say this. And so this is a beautiful Madhav Julian, another great poem, poet's uh, poem called Sangam Utsuk Doha. Ekatra gumfu na jivit dhage Priti che nartan na chalo maage Ekata upami ethe Bhovati shodhi priyete Nadi se ka kothe sodo ni geli Hase na boli na kare na keli and uh, I'll just read the last few lines of the English translation. Uh, so basically he wants to be one with his true love, the ocean vast. Then he says, racked with pangs of desire unfulfilled, wake laborious, dazzled with visions of a union sweet and glorious. Peacocks dancing on earth in splendor, kings, king frog, frogs singing on streams yonder. In that moment, overcome with love and with grace, will you come unswerving into my embrace? Gods in heaven will festoon welcome arches along, while we like crazed minstrels sing an auspicious song amazed and rendered unconscious by love newborn. The saffron color of passion we must don, throwing ourselves down from the edge to surrender our life force we earnestly pledge. Then we will finally attain our union with the ocean supreme. But alas, Ending the cursed season of Vaisak remains but a dream. And there are many other poems, but I think we have, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, revealed quite a few of them. And I encourage you all. There is the fisherman's love song, and then there is the patriotic uh, songs, and uh, so many other. You know, and then there is the ode to the mother lost. You know, there are so many beautiful poems that have been, and that is part of this very unique uh, aspect of this book. That you know, so much of the Indian writing in English, and I know that in the northeast there is also a tremendous uh, interest in English, and uh, you have that advantage in English education. So uh, this is the perhaps the first book I'm told in Indian writing in English which brings out the richness of Marathi culture and literature and poetry. Then this is my first introduction to Marathi language and literature. And um, as I've said, this book has many elements. It has the elements of love, of friendship, of uh, patriotism for your country, and fighting for what is right, woman empowerment. So it is a book that deserves a reread. I think when you first read the book, maybe you will be absorbed by just one element of it, as I was absorbed by the woman empowerment aspect of it and how the protagonist and her sister were so, like, how their education took them that far. So when I reread, maybe I'll be more absorbed with the 
uh, independence and the freedom fighting aspect of it. So it has so many aspects that I encourage you all to read it and try to search for these aspects and different elements when you read so that you can notice them because I think Ma'am has done a job, wonderful, wonderful job for a first novel and I hope we get to see many, many more books from you when we get to read many, many more books written by you in the future. So that comes to the end of our conversation. Uh, thank you for sharing your words of encouragement and your wisdom. I've learned so much and I'm sure your audience have too. So now we will open the floor to the audience for questions. Uh, I encourage everyone to ask questions. Hello, Lao Shu Ji. Thank you so much uh, for that enlightening uh, session. And first off, thank you so much for coming to Aizol uh, and bringing this wonderful book within our reach. I'm like really excited to, you know, uh, get my hands on it. And already, I feel like I read some parts of it because I was so in sync with whatever you had said. Because, and I want to congratulate you on, you know, uh, highlighting the importance of the role of men in a girl's life because uh, I feel deeply with it because uh, I've been very privileged to have uh, those type of men in my life. Uh, first of all, my uncle, who you know, <laughs> yeah, he's always been very, you know, supportive, well, yeah, yeah, very yeah. supportive of me mm. uh, pursuing my passion and not just trying to push me into the life of service, you know. <laughs> my service. And then, uh, then I have my uh, grandfather, uh, who's deceased now, but was also a retired IS, IS officer, was always very supportive and encouraging of me uh, making my own decisions. And then my own father, who's also in the service, who's always uh, nudged me to pursue higher education and you know, to work, you know, uh, to work. So uh, I have one question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, and after you answer me, I'll, I'll uh, explain why I want to ask that specific question. Uh, I haven't even had an informal discussion with my uncle on this question, <laughs> which I should. But since you're the main star today, I want to ask you uh, uh, with your experience with the, in writing the book and with your experience as a diplomat, uh, how important do you feel uh, that our youth, especially the youth of Northeast, uh, have an exposure in terms of ha uh, getting an education abroad, like outside India? Huh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, you know, um, and it is beyond my expertise, let me say, because, you know, why do students go abroad, um, whether it is Punjab, whether it is some other... <coughs> I think higher education, you want to go out because something value added, what is not available in India, or you don't, because it's so competitive in India, that you don't get admission into some of the colleges uh, where, and then there is, you know, the issue of uh, um, eligibility, you know. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's crazy. These days, for example, in some colleges, 100 marks, 100% uh, is the criteria. And so the courts have ruled, for example, the Hindu college set a criteria that you must have 100% in your uh, eyes. And no, but there are more 100 percenters than they have a quota for admitting. So the court ruled, no, if you have set that criteria, you must uh, take all 100 percenters. So you know, there is that element. So if your parents can afford to send you or if you are so bright that you can get a scholarship, then, you know, people choose to go abroad. Uh, but I would say, and, and I don't want to be hypocritical, but because both my daughters, because we were in foreign service, because they went to school when they, they were abroad, we, we were abroad, it became something that was part of their you know, journey that they chose to and were able to, because we were still outside, we were able to support them uh, to study outside. But I would say that do your undergraduate studies in India. 
I think the kind of grounding you get in India, in most colleges I would say, I know that there are some colleges that are not up to the mark in some parts of India and uh, that is something again I am not an authority so with <laughs> due respect to Renu and others who know about this much better. Uh, I think the second degree, if there is some specialization and also go to uh, colleges where you, you will really add value and then some go out to study in their higher education because they want to settle down in a particular place. So these are all, you know, related. So I don't think I can prescribe anything but my general uh, advice would be do your undergraduation in India, it's always a great grounding and then do your specialization, higher studies, PhD, whatever else you want to do abroad. Whether it's in STEM or in, in the humanities or other areas. Thank you so much and also again as a follow-up question, uh, did you consider this aspect of uh, and uh, getting an education abroad for your characters in your book because already they were so ahead of their time. So I just wanted to ask that <laughs> follow-up question. You see, I told you that my original concern and that there will be sequels to this book, I think. <laughs> so my generation, I want to do a novel on. And my daughter, elder daughter's generation, who went when she was 16 years old, she went to study in the U.S. She joined Wall Street when she was 20. So hers is a fascinating story. So drawing upon that, I also want to do a novel. I think the second generation will have that opportunity. <laughs> yes, for them, that's so much of a stride. You know, yes. from Malaki yes. and Kamala. Yes. No, I, no I'm, I don't want to answer her no, question. No, no, it's not directed at me, but just my thought on this is that like, yeah. The protagonists, they are already making so much like difference and like it's a huge strike for them just to go to college. There are only, there are only six girls in their college. So maybe because of their education, the second generation, their kids will be yeah. able to go abroad and maybe further that education and like, you know, have more exposure. Absolutely. Thank you so much and the reason why I asked that specific question was because I was also very privileged to go abroad for my masters. Uh, I got, got a degree from the London School of Economics and then I started working for KPMG. Wow. And then, uh, actually, yeah, because from all the, like, people ask me all the time, why did you come back here to Mizoram? But then, you know, because of all those experience and that exposure that I've had, uh, that I am now in a position to help others, you know, have How that experience wow, abroad. Wonderful. So I just wanted to bring that whole element and if you had considered that for your characters. And I think it was also I because of that that I am Thank you for giving that idea. <laughs> one of the few people who get to interact with you today, you know, because of all those experiences that I've had. Thank you so much. Thank you. And all the very best. You are a shiro, you know, someone who comes back. No, and, and wants to contribute. In nation building, you know, this, this novel is very much, I keep saying this, about young people, for young people, by young people. And that is one of the messages that young people today can make a difference each in their own way. And therefore they should be looking to contribute to the dream that has been, you know, the goal that has been set before us of India, developed India by 2047 and each each day matters and each one can make that contribution. Ma'am, it's such a pleasure to have you here in Aizal and welcome to Mizanam. I mean, pleasure to meet up with you after all these years. <laughs> and uh, we've always known you as a very erudite and multifaceted personality. But today I was just taken aback with your grasp and knowledge of the Marathi shlokas and uh, all this uh, ancient uh, recitation that you did. So was it something that was imbibed in you during your childhood or you sort of rediscovered or and went back to it and has it transmitted to the kids? <laughs> Just a, yeah. No, I, uh, I've always loved poetry and uh, as I said, you know, my father every evening he used to sit 
with us and he would recite one poem. So that was a ritual. It's like, you know, Lori. Marathi uh, poem. Marathi poem. Marathi and, and he would sing it. And he each had a different tune. So, you know, it, it was kind of in our consciousness, uh, imbued into our consciousness. And otherwise also, they used to speak in such poetic terms. My mother was a great lover of Greek mythology as much as she was a lover of Hindu mythology. So she would keep on comparing Hindu goddesses with Greek goddesses and see how this, you know, so he, she would keep it. So therefore we have a character here in Sarla, one of my favorite creations, who first pretends that she is Persephone. And then at another time, she is the goddess of the hunt, Artemis. So, you know, so all of that comes in. Uh, Kalidas, then, you know, Kalidas, uh, these are such beautiful, uh, both, both the, the verses that I have invoked. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I grew up with it, but you are absolutely right. As you go along in your life, uh, some of this gets left behind in reading documents and <laughs> writing books on, on economics or development. You remember from our days when we were doing trade and other things. So yes, but it always remains there with you and of course I'm very uh, fond of theatre, music and poetry. and. Um, I started with my little, my first child, I started uh, poetry with her when she was two and a half. And she's also very fond of uh, literature and poetry and, and yes, even, even my younger daughter. Oh, to some extent, but Marathi, uh, only my uh, elder daughter knows because I had a Marathi nanny for 13 years. <laughs> so she knew Marathi, only Marathi. So. You know, my Imani had to learn Marathi. So and to that extent, extent she knows. I look forward to reading the book. I cannot ask about the book because I haven't read it. <laughs> so it's really whetted my, my curiosity to read about the book. And uh, uh, I would also like to uh, give my wishes to Amelia. You conducted it very well. Your questions were very soul searching and very, very detailed. Absolutely. In fact, as I said, you have reinvented the novel <laughs> in my eyes. Okay, so. Thank you so much, Madam, for coming to us all. And of course, to Amelia, my dearest, she's always done a wonderful job in dissecting her novels and I felt Felt like I've already read the book, actually. <laughs> so as, as uh, we were listening to this conversation, one of the things that came across in my head was that uh, the, the contextual situation of the book appeared to be during the early 1900s, where revolution was in the air. You know, yes. there was yes. the, the, the sounds of freedom mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I've always been, I think, even as a person, being enticed by these kind of eras, because uh -huh. I felt there was so much room to grow and there were so many ideas that I'm you can put yes. yourself in, right? Mm -hmm. So, a lot of the relationships, and even as Amelia and you were having this conversation, I was listening to it, and they were informed by the situation that was taking place within the Indian context and obviously internationally. You know, they had the, the freedom movement that was happening everywhere around in South Asia, and also the communist feeling that was coming up and also with Nazi Germany and, you know, the whole... The, the two whole world European. wars. Yes, yes, yes. So, when I think about all of these things historically and even in terms of my own development and even as I read so many other books, I, I think of how these, these events in the lives of these people can enrich them so much and that translates over to their love for each other. Yes, so I just, very well. Yes. <laughs> I just feel that generation today, you know, we've become so land in our understanding of love mm -hmm. and because we, do, we just don't have so many things to inspire ourselves with anymore. So you as a writer and obviously I can sense some romanticism in you, um, do you think, yes, do you have hope for our generation or, or even the next generation to come to have that kind of like ferocious love like that Amelia had yes. put it? Do we still have hope for that? That's what I wanted to ask. No, I hope that the book ignites, uh, reignites yeah. that sense of romance, that love, 
and the quest for love. You know, I think it's ultimately a quest and you, you, you know, the journey is as important as the destination and it has to be a continuous quest. Uh, indeed, whether it is letters, you know, I've, I've mentioned about letters but they are so potent as an expression of love and I think it's very important not, not only to conceptualize your relationship. You know, we, these days it's down to two words or, you know, to WhatsApp, to uh, even, even there, I mean, we abbreviate everything. But I think it's very important to, in your own mind, conceptualize what is it that you feel for a person and what does the person feel for you so that is one aspect of being in love and then the aspect and then how do you as you said demonstrate it in action in a continuing way uh, how do you commit so all of these elements uh, are very and communication throughout and that's why I, I you know I use this these letters and I, I would commend all of you to read those whatever letters I could reproduce because my editor cut down so much <laughs> I think I need a separate book on those letters they are treasures so you know that's where the longing the, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, also the disappointment yes. with each other but and the complaining but at the same time reaffirming, you know. Even in the complaint there is a reaffirming. So that has to be, uh, and this is, this is something that, and more remote relationships, this is very much about remote relationship period where, and these days, so many of us, I have gone through it, you know, there have been many years when we were posted separately, my husband and I. So we've gone through all that. So how do you stay through it all, all these challenges that modern life throws our way? So yes, I very much hope that this is an ode <laughs> to a rekindling yeah. love and romance uh, in these times. But I also want to talk about this time, these times. I think this is as pregnant with possibilities and as exciting as those times were. So we should be resonating to those times because we are in the process of again a civilizational reawakening. We are in the process of a great cultural uh, renaissance that is happening. Uh, we are also creators of uh, global culture today. You know, it's very exciting where India is today and being recognized so. I think being young in today's India is even more <laughs> exciting than what this novel talks about. But I hope it is uh, a step towards getting young people to recognize that now, here and now and for the future. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you for telling us that conceptualizing life is something that we have to overtly do. And I won't go on with another question, but I do have a comment with, in terms of what Amelia was asking you earlier about how whether in order to move forward, whether women who were making sacrifices in the home and uh, whether they had to be dragged along. But my, I, not, not, not a reply, but I, my understanding would be that uh, in the whole uh, gamut of this human rights and the women's rights movement, I would say that every woman should be allowed to choose the roles that they want to uh, take on, and the sacrifice that they, they, they want to make. So if a woman decides to stay at home and cook for her family, and I still think that that's doing the best job that she can do. So uh, thank you for that. I, I agree. And provided it's a choice that she makes, and it's not imposed on her. That is the thing. Thank you. Um, now we've come to the end of our she 
and ma'am. So first of all, thank you for writing a book like this. And I hope your readership is as much male as it, as it is female, because I really want yes. men and girls to read a story like this, yes. to be given an example of good allyship in the pursuit of, uh, of gender equality. And I wanted to ask you kind of a twofold question. Um, to contextualize, Melinda Gates of the Bill and Gates Foundation had written a book on gender equality that uh, you know, the context being her work in the NGO five years ago, I think. And she talked about this uh, struggle that she and other social workers had, that the women and girls, they wanted to help, who needed help, who re recognized their own need for help. There, there was this hesitation, this suspicion against equality, against empowerment. There is this um, almost resistance to being empowered. And how do we make sure we don't leave these women and girls behind, even you know, in our own lives, even with the women in our families, our friends, our neighborhoods? How do we bring them in the fold of gender equality? And I want yeah. to ask this sort of the second fold. Uh, in my UG, I had asked my professor in sociology, and I asked her, uh, ma'am, do you believe we will achieve gender equality someday? Is that a material thing we will come to someday. And she said, I think we will always be in the pursuit of it. Maybe I don't think we will get there. So I want to ask you, will we swallow the sun and achieve gender equality? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, uh, we used to always say, but well before this novel, uh, we used to always say in our advocacy, we, we used to take out these marches and you know, we took out this 25,000 people march in New York, first time, first ever women's march. And we talked about Planet 5050 by 2030. So, we have to set the goals. We have to set targets. And which is what we have done in SDG 5, the Sustainable Development Goal 5. And we have to make people realize that it is not only good for women and girls, but it is also good for men and boys, for everyone. You know, it's the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do as well. So that making the case is one part. And you are absolutely right that we have to take everyone along. And first of all, it is about convincing women and girls themselves that they need to be in a different place, in a better place. And that is often, uh, often, yeah, and this is what the novel shows. The first time when Baba takes it up in the village uh, council, the women themselves say, we don't want that. We are fine as we are. So the next time, when in his own uh, Desai Kera, where he has created these several villages are brought together under him, he makes sure that when he puts this thing to vote, first of all, he has either intimidated all the councillors, <laughs> men councillors, or, or, you know, induced them with, with some rewards that they don't oppose. But most of all, he makes sure that every woman there says Jai Durga and Jai, you know that we want it so we, we the women have to want it as much as they must claim it hello okay I'm so sorry to be the person to cut this short <laughs> I know there were a lot more questions, but uh, we'll go as scheduled. Uh, Mrs. Poor, I want to say what a delightful session, what a fruitful conversation. And I think I speak for everyone here when I say that we cannot wait to dive into the book. We look forward to it and any more that may come. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. The Baba Kaitan Foundation promotes cross-state cultural understanding and appreciation, recognizing that our nation is a mosaic of cultures that contribute to its richness. This is to support our ongoing efforts to foster unity and appreciation of the rich cultural heritage across India's diverse states by incorporating it in our food and our events. So if you look at the food that we have served here today, uh, the official name for it is Songmoi Desert. It's made from uban, kurtai, maimu, ah, and dragon fruit. So and it is served on kuvata plate, which I'm sure you will recognize. 
So this is something that is representative of the many staples in Bizo culture. So if you haven't had it today, I encourage you to do so. And in the spirit, we would also like to facilitate the author with the Lucknow Chitankari Dupata. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about this. The Chitankari is a signature handloom of the city of Nawabs. It is a traditional and royal textile decoration style, a fusion of fashion and elegance that has become a global trend for fashion enthusiasts. Beginning as a tale of white-on-white -white embroidery, it has evolved as a special fashion embroidery and a much-loved statement, appreciated for its simple yet refined look. So, although we did not tell her in advance, I humbly request our Chief Secretary, Dr. Renu Sharma, to come up here and facilitate Mrs. Puri with the Lagna Chitan Karin Dupata. It's a token of gratitude from the Brother Khan Foundation. <laughs> Dr. Sharma. I also take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to Mrs. Lakshmi Puri for coming here, attending today, Mrs. Amelia Silo on behalf of the Brabha Kaitan Foundation. I also express my sincerest gratitude to our patron, Sri Cement Limited, our hospitality partner, Vogland Park, and of course you, everyone in the audience, you are, what's made, you are what has made the, today a success, and I thank you all so much. And before I leave off, I also want you to I also want to encourage you all to take a complimentary copy of the book, and it will be autogra autogra autographed by the author personally before you leave. Uh, it will be available right there. So thank you and come. Uh, thank you for coming. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Every one of you, kind if you will kindly permit me to thank all of you for coming uh, and being part of this evening. You know, I was a little um, unwell. I was I was struggling with a allergic cold, but it's all gone now <laughs> because it has been so exhilarating to be in conversation with you, Amelia, and with all of you, and uh, you know, to have your rapt attention for such a long time. Uh, and thank you for your patience in every way. But also, I want to thank. Isha Datta, she's been doing a wonderful, and this is a pioneering job, uh, that she has taken charge of uh, now this, bringing this SAS movement uh, to, the, to the Northeast. And I really commend you for that, because this is also about inclusivity, bringing the rest of India to the Northeast and to take Northeast to the rest of India. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Today, I think it was all over you. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much.